Good morning. Let us begin. Does anyone have any question before we start? Mm -hmm. Any concern? So we are going to continue our discussion of chapter 14, which is a very lengthy and <clears throat> often challenging, uh, you know, and condensed chapter. So the objective of chapter 14 is to give you a very detailed understanding about the concept of gross domestic product or GDP, uh, how to calculate it, how to compile information that, that is available in a macroeconomy, and calculate this very important macroeconomic number. We are going to show alternative strategies or alternative approaches that can be utilized to calculate gross domestic product. Uh, then we are going to basically talk about the usefulness of this particular number. What does GDP actually tell us about the macroeconomy? Um, and in that discussion, we are going to um, you know, talk about the possibility that our GDP numbers are not giving us the actual picture of the macroeconomy. So in order to get a more accurate picture of what how the economy is doing, uh, in order to compare economic performance of today with uh, some time in the past, we will come up with a different measurement. We will call it real GDP and compare that with the nominal GDP. Uh, if time permits us even further, we are going to talk about the limitations of these GDP calculations. What can the GDP number reflect and what it cannot cover or what it cannot include. I am pretty sure that we are not going to have any more time after the after looking at the criticism of the GDP. If we have, we might uh, you know further highlight the you know the you know the importance of GDP uh, as a as a macroeconomic indicator, and at the same time provide some further criticism. So this chapter is all about GDP. This is a very difficult chapter because. Some of these approaches are very data intensive and not only do you need to understand how to do these calculations, you need to also understand the uh, motivation or the intuition behind why we are picking up some numbers to calculate GDP and why we are leaving out some of them. Because the macroeconomy is littered with information about the macroeconomy. We do not use all of them, we just use some of them. At any point of time today, if you have any question, please stop me and ask questions. This chapter is very important for your upcoming exam. In the last class, we stopped, stopped at this point, and <clears throat> we pointed out that the circular flow diagram provides us with a very simple and intuitive blueprint as how you can measure the macroeconomic activity and how you can calculate GDP. When we look at the circular flow diagram, we realize that the total income of the economy which can come from income that households receive from firms. It can come from uh, other sorts of you know, other sources like government providing part of your income if you are poor, or government giving subsidy to firms if they are uh, you know satisfying certain conditions. The income of the economy would be one way to calculate the GDP of the economy because the assumption is that. If the uh, economy is earning certain income, that income is being spent on the goods and services that the economy produces. So according to circular flow diagram, the income of the economy is equal to the spending of the economy, is equal to the revenue of the economy, and finally, it is equal to the production of the economy. And production of the economy is what a GDP is trying to capture. So following the circular flow diagram, we are going to find three alternative approaches. 
that we will that we will use today to calculate GDP. The first one would be to think about how we can calculate GDP based on the production activities of the economy, because that would be the most direct and in some cases the most accurate way of calculating GDP. The second approach that we are going to uh, adopt is to figure out the total spending on the macroeconomy. What are the various sources of expenditures that are carried out by the overall economy? If we can identify those sources of expenditures, we should be able to add them together and that should be equal to GDP as well. The final and the most challenging approaches of calculating uh, GDP is to figure out the income of the economy. As we are going to see, identifying income is pretty, uh, you know, uh, difficult because, you know, what is income to you is cost to someone else. And then even if you think that as a firm you are earning this whole stream of profit, none of these or only some of these could be part of your income as a firm. Most of it is basically spent as expenditures on other factors of production. So, as I mentioned before, that this chapter has a lot of supplemental materials, which I already uploaded in Blackboard. I'm going to switch back and forth between these supplemental materials. So, when you are studying for this chapter, for the upcoming quiz and homework, please make sure you go back to the video lecture and figure out how I am mapping these various supplemental materials to create a sort of coercive discussion in today's class. The first one that I am going to, the first supplemental material that I am going to use is uh, from a, you know, from a chapter that, uh, from a textbook that I used to use before. And this, uh, you know, this particular supplemental material will start with calculating GDP by this so-called value-added approach, or in simple terms, the production approach. What is production approach? That right, is very simple. Actually, it is too simple. In the production approach, you figure out the, the new production that has taken place in a macroeconomy. You go to each of these firms, you ask them, hey, how much you have produced? Or firms at the end of the year report their productive acti production activities through their taxations. You identify all the new production that has taken place and you add them together and you get the GDP. It's a very simple idea. In practicality, this appro approach is probably the most difficult to measure. Why? Because sometimes it is difficult to I I I, you know, identify the production activities by a firm. In the last class, take for example, the fact that we talked about this car, which is a final good, and the tire that is, that is produced by Michelin. So Michelin produces tires for a car. For Michelin, the tire is a final product. But for us, as macroeconomists, a tire is an intermediate good. So we really cannot add the value of the tire to the GDP calculation because we are already including the value of the car in our GDP calculation. If we mistakenly add the value of the tire separately in the GDP calculation, we are going to be committing this so-called double counting problem. We are going to kind of calculate the value of that tire twice. Once as part of the car, the second as part of the production carried out by Michelin. Are we all clear on that? So the production approach therefore tries to identify this so-called value addition by each of these firms. The idea behind value addition is fundamental to our understanding of the macroeconomy. In actual production process, the production goes through various stages of production. What does that mean? It means that the production, almost every large-scale manufacturing production does not go through a single step. It's not like the firms can gather all their factors of production and can produce a car in a fortnight. It doesn't work out that way. Most of the production of final goods and services goes through several stages of production where several firms might be involved in each stage. So what we have to do in this value addition approach is to figure out how much 
of the total final output is being contributed by each of these farms in the intermediate stage. So therefore, we are trying to, or we will be trying to, calculate the value addition contributed by every firm in a long series of production processes. So, the theory looks complicated. Let me just provide you with an example, a very simple example. But the example highlights the true nature of complexity involved in this value addition approach. Imagine, for example, we are looking at an example of oil, gasoline, that you and I buy from the gas station. So for us, gasoline is a final product, a real clear. Now gasoline goes through several stages of production. Each stage is very, very important. Imagine that the first stage of gasoline production starts with a driller that basically drills the oil from up. Imagine that the amount of oil that the driller drills from art has a value of $3. Okay, so the oil drilling company drills the oil and sells that oil as crude oil to probably a refining company. Now if you are at the earliest part of the production process, whatever you produce is value added to the economy. The total value of the crude oil, $3, is the value addition by the oil drilling company to the macroeconomic GDP calculation. Are we all clear on that? If you are a farmer who is producing wheat, which is going to play a significant role in the value addition of a lot of different products produced in the economy, from cake to whatever, your contribution is the greatest in the GDP calculation because you are the primary producer. Are we all clear? Similar to an agricultural producer, a farmer, an oil driller has the highest contribution to the productive activity or to the production of gasoline. So the oil driller sells the oil, crude oil, at $3 to the oil refining company. The oil refining company refines that oil and sells for about $3.30 to probably a shipping company that is going to take the refined oil and distribute them. Are we all there? Now, the refining company is charging $3.30 for the same oil that was produced by the drilling company. So notice that out of this $3.30, $3 was already contributed by the previous producer in the supply chain. So therefore, for the refining company, the value addition that they add to the GDP calculation is just 30 cents. Please take a moment to understand this value addition. Does it make sense? The driller adds $3, the refining company adds only 30 cents. The shipping company that buys this oil from the refining company takes that oil and basically sells that to the retailers from which you and I are going to buy that gasoline. The shipping company sells that oil, refined oil now, to $3.60. For $3.60, they basically sell the refined oil. Now, out of this $3.60, $3.30 was contributed by the previous two producers in this supply chain. So, therefore, our shipping company only adds $3.60 minus $3.30, 30 cents worth of new product in the economy. Do we all see that? Finally, the retail gas station sells that same oil to you for $4. Out of that $4, $3.60 was already contributed by the three previous producers in the supply chain. So the retailer adds only $0.40 cent worth of new product in the economy.
After you identify the value addition by each of these terms, the task is very simple. You simply add them together, and the total value addition of the you know various producers in this economy is equal to four dollar. So in the GDP calculation, this four dollar will be added. And this is how you are going to repeat that same process for every possible production of every possible new good in the economy. And you can see immediately that this is basically not a realistic way of calculating GDP. Because so much data is involved. So much data, so much calculation is involved here. Another interesting fact to note is that the value of the final good that you and I are buying from the gas station is also equal to the total value addition by each of these firms in this production process. This particular assumption is based on the circular flow diagram that we have just looked at. So you can either take the market value of the final goods and services that are being sold in the marketplace or you can simply identify the value addition of each of these producers in the supply chain add them together and that will be your gdp so the question is several questions basically not one this is clearly the the most accurate way of calculating gdp because you are identifying the new production of goods at each possible stage of production we all immediately understand that this process of calculating collecting data is very tedious why are we talking about this why not simply abandon this particular strategy and use some alternative ones which we are about to see in a minute which are much more tractable much easy to collect data on the answer to this very important question, it's a deep question, and the book doesn't talk about that, is that there are certain usefulness of identifying this value addition. How many of you are familiar with this idea of a value added tax, or add a Villora tax, or VAT? Anyone familiar with this? Add Villora tax, or a value added tax or simply VAT is a taxation strategy where the government does not tax you on the entire product that you are selling but only the value addition you are making to the economy. So if there was a value added tax on the retailer, the gas station owner, he would not pay tax on the $4 but he would pay tax only on the 30, uh, on the 40 cents value addition the farm has contributed to the economy. Do we see the importance of that? Proponents of VAT, which is a very common or popular means of taxation in many of the countries around the world, including the country that I'm from, argues that this is probably the most accurate way of taxing the farms. Because if we are simply charging them on their overall revenue, which for this retailer is indeed equal to $4, we are taxing them too much. Because they are not really contributing $4 worth of output to the economy. They are only contributing $0.40. Cent. So we should tax according to their value addition to the economy. Make sense? I, I am going to be covering a lot of materials today, but at the same time, I will take a lot of breaks today by going back and forth between materials. So it is important to keep track of what we are doing today. So just an example. I actually I don't have an example um, let's do I do um, let's look at a example from one of my macro exam
Um, I think I need to go back. Okay, I am having trouble finding an example for you guys, but I um, I will I will upload some questions for the value added approach, and in the next class we are going to talk about that. I know I have questions, I so I just simply don't see them, but it's fine. But based on this simple exercise, is it clear, or at least from the theoretical side, does it uh, make sense as? how you can use the value added approach to calculate GDP or do you have any question about how value addition is calculated now most of the times GDP is not going to be calculated by using this rather tedious approach the approach that economists you know, use in real life are the two approaches that we are about to see. The next approach that we are going to talk about is this so called expenditure approach. Yes. Um, you can. No, no, you, you can do that. You can do that. And that's exactly what we're going to do in a minute. The idea behind this is that to show that this probably is the most accurate way of calculating GDP because rather than figuring out the market data or the income, uh, this tries to pin down the actual production of the economy. So this is a theoretical course. So we need to have both an understanding about the theory and the practice. Yes. Uh, no, it will be a different approach, and we are going to we are going to have a much more extensive discussion today about export and import. So, before we move to the next approach, which is the most common and most extensively used approach of calculating GDP, let us remind ourselves some of the, you know, uh, you know, trivial things about GDP calculation that we sometimes forget. So I want to make sure that we don't forget about these things. Number one, any kind of paper transaction is not included in the GDP. If you own a bunch of stocks, the value of those stocks are not part of the GDP calculation. Are we all clear on this? Because GDP is only interested about the value of physical goods and services. If you have a whole lot of money in your bank, those money is not counted in the GDP calculation. If you have financial assets, those assets are not included in the GDP calculation. But if you own a piece of land, the value of that land could be factored into the GDP calculation, which we are going to see. Um, also, please remember that the GDP calculation is very, very concerned about the geographical boundary of the economy. Any good, any new goods and services that were produced within the boundary of a country in a, in a given period of time is part of the GDP calculation. And final one, no old goods are going to be part of the GDP calculation. If you are trying to calculate GDP of 2019 and you have a you know 2018 model car that you are driving in 2019, 
the value of the car is not part of the 2019 GDP calculation because it's an old product. Are we all clear on that? But, but please remember that in our everyday life, we use a lot of used products on a regular basis. A car is just one of the examples. So when you are using a car, an old car, in today's time, the value of the car is not part of the GDP calculation, but the service the car provides to you is a new service. And that service is part of the GDP calculation. More on that in a minute. Sometimes, and we are going to do that today, we are interested in not the boundary concept of the GDP. As we are all aware that a country might have some of its factors of production located outside. If you are an American citizen operating an ice cream parlor in Germany, you are part of the factors of production owned by USA. Are we all clear? Because you are a citizen. In the past, especially uh, till the 1990s, economists used to calculate a different measurement of production, which is we call gross national product, where the process of finding uh, all the various factors or all the various productive activities are very, sim very similar. You identify the total value of new goods and services, but instead of focusing on the border, you focus on everywhere these factors of production are located. Which means that if you are an American citizen making some profit in Germany operating an ice cream parlor, the contribution that you are making to the US economy is also included in the GDP calculation. That part kind of makes sense because if we want to figure out the, you know, the, pro, the total production that the nation, that the citizens of this country are contributing, we need to include everyone regardless of where they live, right? The ups, downside of this argument, and that is why this approach was completely abandoned, is because if you are including the value of goods and services produced by American citizens living abroad, you also have to subtract the value of goods and services produced by foreign citizens living in USA. Because they are not American citizens. And sometimes, for some countries, like Singapore, where 90% of the population are foreign born, or even doesn't even have a citizenship status, those calculations could become very complicated. More on that in a minute. Some, uh, you know, uh, before thoughts, let's now jump into the true predomin two predominant methods that are used to calculate GDP. The first one is called the expenditure approach, which is very simple. You just figure out expenditures made by every player in the macroeconomy, add them together, and that should be equal to the production of the economy. It's a very straightforward and very commonly used approach of calculating GDP. The other one, which also sounds very intuitive, but again, quite difficult, is to calculate the income of everyone in the economy. The motivation and the intuition are very simple. If you can identify all the income of everyone in the economy, those income is spent on all the production of the economy. Hence, by finding income, you can find the GDP. Are we all there? So both the expenditure approach and the income approach are indirect ways of calculating GDP. Why do we adopt incorrect, indirect approaches? Because they are easier to identify and collect data on. Where would you get expenditure data by? Expenditures by farms, expenditures by households, expenditures by government, and also expenditures by the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world could also be buying some of our products. We also would be buying some of the product produced outside the economy. Where would you get this information? Please think about this question. This question will not be in the exam, but these are some of the questions that we need to understand to fully appreciate the calculation of GDP. The US government institution, 
that calculates this singular number called GDP is called Bureau of Economic Analysis. It's a federal government owned research institution and the current number of employee in BEA is about 20,000. So the institution has almost as many employees as the as University of Arkansas has students. This giant organization basically does a couple of things and one of them is simply to calculate this GDP. So why do we need such a large labor force to calculate this singular number? Because the process is very complicated. And the number that comes out is very, very important. So let us now look at this so-called expenditure approach. The idea behind the expenditure approach is very simple. In order to calculate expenditure approach, you need to figure out the spending done by all the major players of our economy. If you remember the circular flow diagram, you should remember that there were four major players in our macroeconomy. Farms, households, governments, and the rest of the world. So in this process, in this approach, we are going to simply calculate the expenditures carried out by each of these players. The first categorization of these expenditures is called personal consumption expenditures. These are the expenditures carried out by households in our economy. The next category of expenditure is called gross private domestic investment. These are expenditures carried out by firms. And some cases by households. And we're going to see where those households expenditures are part of investment. This second category is by far the most important expenditure on the macroeconomy because investment, as we are going to argue in a future chapter, is the engine of economic growth. Most of these investment expenditures are carried out by firms, and the expenditures include buying plants, equipments, uh, and you know, buying infrastructures like residential infrastructures commercial infrastructures, and finally this idea of inventory will be discussed in a minute. The next category of expenditure is expenditures carried out by government, and government also can carry out investment like building a road, highway for all of us to drive on, that could be also considered an investment, we are going to talk about that in a minute. And the final category of expenditures that we are going to calculate is basically export minus import. We are going to calculate the value of export, we are going to calculate the value of import, and we are going to calculate this number. Before we look at the you know, characterization and declassification of these categories, I want to come back to that question that I just raised in a couple of minutes. Where do you get all this information? To begin with, the data on export and import are very easy to collect. You just go to the customs duty and ask them how much import the country has made and how much export the country has sent abroad. These numbers are pretty compact, very easy to identify because there is a singular institution, government institution, that collects this data. Data on government consumption and gross investment is also well recorded because government keeps track of how much money they spend. The problem of this approach is the, is the first two. Why would you get expenditures carried out by households? How do you know how much households have spent in a given year? Uh, be more specific. Let's start with the fact, uh, let's start with the second question. Why don't you get the information on the income of the household? <laughs> Very good. The, the most common source of household 
expenditure would be the tax the uh, form that the household is submitting on a yearly basis that's obviously true right but remember that these tax informations are collected on a yearly basis right that's the problem because we need this probably on a higher frequency probably on a quarterly basis or something so in order to find information on consumption expenditures BEA will carry out a monthly survey a monthly survey where they are going to you know, survey a very large chunk of the US population and that sample will give an idea about how the entire US population is spending their money on. That survey is called consumer expenditure survey and the, and the name is kind of obvious, right? In those surveys, people are being asked, hey, how much money you have spent on these, that and those, right? Are we all clear? So there are two sources of information about consumption expenditure survey, tax, and this particular survey that I just talked about. The most, most complicated part of this expenditure approach is to figure out information about private domestic investment. <clears throat> How do you get those information? Number one, firms all have to report that uh, as part of their tax report. Firms will regularly report on how much new machines that they have purchased because they get tax incentive on that. They are going to report how much new plant size they have acquired, how many new machines that they have purchased, whether they have <coughs> recruited a new uh, you know, infrastructure, things like that. So the major source of firm expenditure or investment comes from tax. Also, similar to the consumer expenditure survey, there is a business survey carried out by BEA as well, where they would go to business establishments and ask them to provide detailed information about their expenditures. These approaches are very serious, they are done on a regular basis, and the amount of data that is compiled are enormous. So, there are practical way of calculating and compiling this data and after you compile the data you should be able to calculate the so called GDP. Let's now look at the breakdown of these various expenditures. Before we go, back, go to the breakdown, this is how the GDP is going to be calculated. You identify consumption expenditure, the expenditure by the household investment expenditure, expenditure by firms, government expenditure, expenditure by the government, export, this is expenditure by the rest of the world, do you all see that? Because these were goods that were produced in USA, like a computer produced by Dell, but then sold abroad, let's say, to China. Make sense? Why are we subtracting import? Do you see that? The answer is very simple. Imports are not part of the calculation because imports are goods that were produced in a foreign country, right? The question is, why not simply ignore it? Why not have the GDP calculation looking like that? What's the problem? Can anyone tell me? Why not simply calculate C, I, G and the export which is goods sold to a foreign country and why is that not at the GDP? Yes. You have to take into account how much more you're exporting than you import. What you import does go to the How? You, you uh, the the. The correct part of your statement is the very last two sentence uh, word that you said, that, that you have said. So how does import get into all this information? You are right by the Okay, true, how? Because if you buy a machine from Germany, the machine is reported by you as a firm as part of your expenditure. Do you see that? That that good was imported. 
but you are using it in your production activity. So when you are reporting all this information about C, I, and G, you are not really reporting whether the good is in, good is a American good or a foreign good. Do you see that? If you buy a French wine, your consumption expenditures include that French wine, which should be subtracted, which should not be part of your consumption expenditure. If you are a government that is buying a foreign-made plane, a jet fighter plane, you are including that in your GDP calculation, but that good is not produced in USA. Do you all see that? So the, all the stuff that the country imported are already embedded in these numbers. So you have to subtract the total value of import to get a true measurement of how much the economy is producing. Any question? Okay, let's now look at the breakdown. This is an actual table of GDP calculation using expenditure approach for the US economy in 2012. Actual data. We're going to start from the top and go to the bottom. We're going to start with personal consumption expenditures. Personal consumption expenditures are expenditures carried out by households. And when we calculate that, we basically create three sub-classification of these expenditures. We assume that consumers spend money on three different types of activities. First, they will spend money on these so-called durable goods like buying a car, makes sense? A good that stays with you for a long time. They will spend a lot of money on non-durable goods like buying milk, which you buy on a regular basis, but they are not durable, right? And finally, households are going to spend a lot of money on services. As you can see, household expenditure on services is way, is double the expenditure on durable and non-durable goods. Why? Because anytime you get a haircut or take your car to a mechanic and have your oil changed, or you call Apple service provider and ask for their assistance to you know, fix your you know, app, you know, you know, uh, you know, computer equipments, these are all services that you are paying for. And we pay for a lot of services. If you have a, if you have a health insurance, and the premium that you pay is actually a service, you all understand that. Okay, so household expenditure is equal to the sum of expenditure on durable goods, non-durable goods, and services. Pretty straightforward. The private gross domestic investment is basically where most of the confusions and the calculation complications are. So I would like to be very, very slow on this part. If you have any questions, please stop me and ask questions. The first investment category is non-residential investment, where firms will buy machines, they will buy you know, infrastructures, they will buy plants, they will sometimes buy tractors, any investment on these machines are non-residential investment. They are obviously important. The next one is called residential investment. This is basically firms buying infrastructures, actual residential infrastructure. Some of these infrastructures could be used for commercial purposes, but remember, residential infrastructures means buildings, dwelling places. Farms use that for production activities, household use that for living inside them. Now, the first important noted complication is that non is that residential investment is going to include buying house by both households and firms. You might notice that this is a bit of complication, right? Because we are saying that gross private domestic investment is invest, uh, expenditures carried out by firms and I have just introduced households in the residential investment category. So if you're a household and you're buying a new house in 2019, the house that you purchase is not going to be part of durable goods 
you know, purchased by you, but it will be part of the investment. Are we all clear on this? The question is, why do we do that? Why do we not include the value of the house, new house that I have in my consumption expenditure, but I use, why use, but I use that in the investment categorization? Any thought on this? Yes. Your car also have to depreciate, right? Your oh, we are we are ignoring the old houses for the time being, right? If you live on an old house, the services that you get by living on that old house is part of the services expenditure. The rent that you pay for the old house is for the services that you are receiving from that old house. We all see that. If you pay a mortgage on our old house, because most of the times we pay mortgage for like 30 years, mortgage is basically a, a, an opportunity cost of living on the house and mortgage cost is part of GDP calculation, but the value of the actual house is not. We have already covered that. The question is why put house in investment category and not in durable expenditure by household category? The answer to that, uh, you know, seemingly complicated question is very simple. We don't know. This is just a political stunt carried out by every country in the world. Every country wants to make their gross investment number big. Why? Because investment is a very important you know, number for a lot of investors. If if investors are seeing that a country is investing a lot on their economy, it gives them a sense that the country is trying to improve itself. So investment is like a, you know, ammunition to your fire. It's like the engine that is going to take the economy to a higher economic growth path. Investment number is very, very important. So one could argue that by including the you know, you know, houses bought by households, they are, we are basically inflating the value of the investment in the economy, which in some sense is true, but then there is a deeper truth. There is a deeper reason why house purchased by you and me, households, not firms, are considered investment. And the answer lies in our fundamental understanding about investment. So what is investment? Investment is you spend some money today and you get some return in the future, right? Right? This should be obvious to everyone. Now economics treats investment in a very different way than finance or accounting or any other business, business area. In finance, if you buy a piece of shit, if you buy a stock, it is called investment. In economics, if you buy a stock, it is called saving. More on that in a future chapter. In economics, the only investment is investment on productive activities of the economy. Investment is productive activities on the economy. But the objective is that you are going to put money today and you are going to expect some return tomorrow. That's the basic motivation for investment. Are we all clear on that? And in that very, very basic sense, buying a house is like an investment. Because you are buying that house so that you can live on that house in the future, not paying a rent in a rental places. The value of your house can appreciate. So on, so many things can happen. So you buying a house is basically like a farm buying a machine that it can use to produce output in the future. Do we all see what I'm talking about? So in the very basic sense, a household purchasing a house is like an investment made by a farm. Make sense? Okay, so the last, the next one is probably the most contentious part of the investment rate for a variety of different reasons. The next component is called change in business inventories. Change in business inventories. What is an inventory? 
anyone, does anyone know what an inventory is? Inventory is unsold products. Right? <laughs> Stuff that you cannot sell is inventory. So let's say GM produces 100 cars in 2019, sells only 50 of them. The reminder of the 50 cars that GM cannot sell in 2019 is the inventory of GM. Now, a very important question. Please think about this question before you answer it. When we are calculating the GDP of 2019, should we include the value of all the 100 cars that GM has produced? Or should we only include the 50 cars that GM was able to sell? Remember the definition of GDP. GDP is the market value of all the new goods and services that were produced in a given year. Which means that if you do not sell the good in the market, that should not be part of the GDP calculation. Do we see the conundrum here? The confusion? Coming back to the original question. How many cars should be added to the GDP of 2019? 100, the production, or 50, they are also. Okay? Why? Okay? But you produced 100, right? Which means that you basically contributed 100 car worth of new production to the macro economy. And that cannot be ignored. That's why we have added this third category of investment. What GM will do, and please hear this carefully because you are going to get questions on this. What GM will do is that GM will add these 50 cars that they were, they produced in 2019, but were not able to sell in their inventory. So 50 cars sold in the market, part of the GDP. 50 cars not sold in the market, but in the inventory part of the GDP as well. So, now sometimes firms maintain a continual inventory, right? GM, uh, I remember uh, one time I went to a GM store and had this audacity to buy a GM SUV. Uh, that was, I think, year 2008 or uh, nine. And GM actually had an inventory of new cars uh, that they were not able to sell as back as 2005. So we're talking about a time when GM was make, make, making a lot of loss. They were not able to sell a lot of their cars. If you, if, you, if you remember that time, it was horrible for GM. So companies like GM continues to maintain inventory. So anytime this 50 new cars were added to the old inventory, inventory changes, right? Let's say previously GM had a total of 250 cars in their inventory. Now with the addition of this new 50, they now have a third 300 car inventory cars, right? So the change in the inventory is the addition of the new cars that GM produced but not were able to sell. Therefore, that 50 unsold new cars are included in the changes in the business inventories. Are we all clear on this? In this particular year, 2012, changes in the business inventory was 60, I think, billion US dollars. So these were 60 billion dollar worth of and, you know, newly produced goods, but unsold by all the firms in the economy, and they have to be part of the GDP calculation. So, two very important aspect of investment: house purchase by households is part of the residential investment, and inventory includes goods that are unsold. Both of which are in direct contradiction of our concept of how GDP should be calculated. But they are doing anything. Yes? You said earlier that the firms private investing in the US, they want to be able to make money. What's your opinion on that? 
very good question um, right in 2012 the gross private domestic investment as fraction of your GDP was 13 percent 13 percent which is one of the lowest in the developed world USA despite having this gigantic economy despite having such a large manufacturing sector and firms in you know investing so much of their profit is one of the countries that has the lowest amount of investment there is no magic number no magic number for china that investment number is about 40 percent for india that the private domestic investment private investment as a fraction of gdp is like 35 for japan that number is 70 percent there is no magic number, right? As an economist, um, I do a lot of research on this. The average investment as a fraction of GDP number for USA over the last 100 years has been 20 percent, which is which appears to be kind of healthy because US economy has been growing. So we don't know. Good question, The next one is government consumption and gross investment consumption and investment notice that in the definition it appears that government can be a consumer government can be an investor do you see that how can the government act like a household yeah if the government buys meals for the you know tornado striking people right government buys a lot of goods like a regular household from the market every day do you all see that does it make sense? Okay, so government can act like a household. So many expenditures carried out by the government is like, you know, is like consumption. What about, what about investment? Does government invest? Can the government invest like a farm? That's a easy yes. If the government is building an infrastructure like a university or a, or a hospital or a highway, these are basically government expenditures on residential units, right? Government can buy machines. You all see that. So government is one of those agents in our macroeconomy that can act like households sometimes, can act like firms sometimes. But what we do is that we collect all those informations and we call it G. Now G also has another interesting dimension. Government expenditures has multiple layers. There is a federal level government expenditures, there is a state level government expenditures, and there is a local level government expenditures. You have to calculate all of them. Can anyone give me an example of a government expenditure? Yes. You're talking about government consumption and gross investment. It does. It does. Uh, the question will be important for a future chapter where we are going to talk about unemployment and we are going to argue that although government spending on military or defense is part of GDP calculation, the entire you know, force that is involved in US military is not part of the labor force. The motivation of including government expenditure on defense is obvious. Because when the government provides defense, government is providing you and me a service. So there is no ambiguity that any time the US government buys a new you know, a, a jet plane or you know, a, you know, builds a new tank, it is part of the GDP calculation. Okay? Any example about an exa a, a, a government expenditures carried out by the federal government? Yes. Good. Good. So when the government pays uh, traveling allowances to their employees, when they are traveling, like the FBI agents. All those expenditures are part of com consumption because government is paying for the services. Makes sense. I was thinking more of like building the federal highway, a massive infrastructural investment that is a federal level government expenditure. What about a state, law, a state government expenditure? Uh, you 
you are, you are, being, you are being too narrow. Uh, fixing the pot, pothole is an example of a local level government expenditure. Very good. This university that we are all studying is an example of a state level government expenditure. Because the state government builds universities and hospitals, federal government builds highways, what does the local government do? It's just a, yeah, one example of portfolio, you know, uh, fix, fixation is, is, is obviously a good example. Policing is a classic example. Your disposal services that the city of Fayetteville offers to you is a service that's an example of a local level government expenditures. You have to calculate information in all of them, you have to add them. The last one is net export, which is export minus import, that's kind of obvious. You just calculate that and collect that information from the customs border authority, you should be good. Notice that this number is negative and it is negative big time, right? It's a big time negative number. So net export in USA in 2012 was 50, 566 billion US dollars. So USA in 2012 imported more than it export. In, a, in the next chapter, we will be looking at this net export data and we're gonna see that starting from the 1950s, with the exception of only one year, 1970, net export in USA has always been negative. Right? USA has been a country that was always importing more than it exports. Those of you who follow, who follow politics should be aware that this has suddenly become a really, really contentious political issue. Suddenly people are arguing as to why US economy exports less than it imports. Is it a good idea for a country to import more than it exports? Okay, uh, maybe, why? Well, I, since the standard of living in the US is Very good. Very, very impressive answer. So if a country is importing a lot of foreign goods, it means that people in this country actually has a very high standard of living. When you can afford caviar, Russian caviar, which is very expensive, not produced in USA, it means that you have the money to spend on it. So higher import is a good indicator of our higher standard of living. Do we all understand that? So countries that have a higher standard of living where people have a lot of money obviously are going to import more than what the export is going out, right? So this net, negative net export number is actually a good indication of the US economy. Right? Okay. So I covered all these. I'm going to skip the eBay stuff. I think I covered all these. I think I covered, uh, well, this, I'm going to skip that. We covered all these. We covered a lot of material today. Any question about the expenditure approach? But this is what we have covered so far. Give me a minute, I'll come back. So we have identified expenditure approach as the sum of Four expenditures made by four major players in our economy. C, consumption expenditure. I, investment expenditure. G, government expenditures. And net export expenditure made by the rest of the world. We're going to see some examples in a minute. But before that, one question. Yes. So like if you buy something here three days, how does that apply? Okay, be more specific. So like when you buy a car, I guess, here, instead of like you buy a That's a really, really good question. Can anyone answer that question? Did we all understand the question that we just asked? So you buy a $30,000 worth of a car from GM. GM gives you a $5,000 rebate, which they are offering right now. <laughs> How much of the value of that car should be included in the GDP calculation? 30,000 
or 30,000 minus 5. Why? Okay, but where does that five thousand dollar rebate go? It balances out. You report paying less than five thousand dollar, so your income goes up, and fund receive uh, you know reports receiving less uh, five thousand dollar less, so their income goes down. So they balance each other out. So the total value of the production remains unchanged. So this kind of activities between individuals do not really alter the calculation of our GDP. I am really, really impressed with today's class participation. And I hope that you are finding these discussions fascinating. This is important stuff. Let's take a break from our class lecture and then we'll do some calculations. The problems that we are about to see are very, very important. Because you are going to see questions like this in the upcoming exam. Let's say you are given this table, and you will be. So given all these numbers, you are asked to calculate GDP. If you see a table like that, you need to memorize and remember how this GDP is calculated. You need to remember how each of the component of the GDP is calculated, like how to calculate C, how to calculate I, how to calculate G, and how to calculate net export. So, before you start solving your problem, you should identify the various components of this expenditure. For example, notice that durable goods is part of C, non-durable goods is part of C, services are part of C. So, you have to add these three to get C. Yes, please. My recommendation would be to first identify C, I, G, and net export, then add them together. But your, your idea is simple, your idea is right. Everything has to be added, but sometimes when you are adding blindly, you end up adding stuff that are irrelevant. So you have to be careful. So we notice that all the components of C is there, durable, non-durable, and services. We notice all the component of investment is there, non-residential, residential, and changes in business inventories. We notice that all the component of G is available, federal purchase of goods and services, state and local purchase of goods and services. We notice that all the component of net export is available. You have information on export and you have information of imports. So what you should do is you should calculate each of these camp components, C, I, and G, separately. Can you guys all see from the back side? Can you see it from the back side? Okay, so you calculate C, you calculate I, you calculate G, you calculate net export, and therefore your GDP is the sum of these four numbers, and you find your correct answer. Makes sense. I have like five minutes, and in that five minutes, I do not want to introduce the next approach because it's going to take time. Rather than doing that, let's solve some in class problems. They are also equally important. So please try to understand the idea behind this question. Right? Okay, let's look at question number one. This is about the definition of GDP and they are going to be in your exam. I'm going to ask you trivial questions about GDP and you need to make sure that you answer them correctly. Gross domestic product, A, the total spending of everyone in the economy, true. B, the value of all output in the economy, we just showed the value added approach. C, the total income of everyone in the economy, which we did not show, but we will show in the next class. So the correct answer is D, every, all of the above. Okay, let's look at question number two. Please take a moment.
anyone? B. Uh, why is A not the correct answer? So wheat, a bakery purchases is an intermediary good because they are trying to make bread. Coffee beans, Starbucks purchases is an intermediary good or raw materials. Lumber, purchased by a construction company because they are trying to make furniture or structures for the house, you know, to build the house are all examples of intermediary goods. But if the government purchases a computer, the government is going to use that. So that, an exam that is an example of a final good. Very good. A variation of question number three is in your upcoming quiz, in your homework, and, your, and in your exam number three. So let's look at question number three. This is not, so we are not talking about you purchasing a car. If you are purchasing a car, the four tires that comes with the car is already part of the car, right? This is the tire that you are going to Michelin and buying it for your own use. So are we all clear on that? So, so for you, this tire is a final good. Every other example here are examples of goods that should not be calculated in the GDP calculation because they are not new products, right? Or they are raw materials or intermediary goods. Do we all see that? Any question? Question number four. Okay, so the value of a 2008 boat that you purchased from a boat dealer in 2013. It is true that you have purchased the good in 2013, but the good that you have purchased is an old good, and hence it should not be part of the GDP calculation. What would be? The 2013 salary of a used motorcycle salesperson. So the guy basically sells old motorcycles. That's not important, right? The salesman provides the service. And the wages that he receives is for the new services he provides. So his salary is part of the income and the GDP of 2013. C. The commission earned by a real estate agent who is selling old condominiums. Again, he's selling old stuff, but he's getting that commission for the new service that he's providing. D, the value of a refrigerator manufactured in 2013, but not sold in 2013. That's inventory. And it is part of the GDP calculation. Very good. Let's do one more. Um, 